continually learn things about myself. Do you all do that? I hope we're all open to where we see ourselves more clear all the time. Because it's kind of hard to do. It's easy for us to see stuff in other people. But it's a little harder for us to see stuff in ourselves. And one of the things I'm coming to terms with, and I'm learning, I'm adapting to it, is forgetfulness. Anybody else have this deal with forgetfulness? I mean, it's just flat irritating, isn't it? I go to one room to get something or do something, and when I get there, I have no clue why I'm there. I go all the way back to where I was at, and I think of, oh yeah, that's what it was, and I go back, and, did you open it? And I forget it again. If I don't write it down anymore, it's bad. It's really getting bad. I mean, how about, here's one that I did when I was writing this sermon. This one's fresh. I go in the kitchen. I fix me a big uh, jug of uh, ice water to take with me to work. I go, when I get to my chair, I have a place in my house where I work in my chair and I sit down in my chair and I look up and across the room, across the kitchen is my jug. I mean, how can I fix it and leave it over there? But I did it. I did it. Irritating, isn't it? But forgetting things can occasionally cause real problems. I remember one time I was supposed to teach a CPR class. And I had supper on the table, and we just sat down to supper, and the phone rang, and they went, uh, Nancy, are you supposed to be teaching a CPR class? And I went, yeah, but it ain't going to happen, because it was an hour to the place. So there was no way. I felt so bad. Or how about this one? Forgetting to renew your driver's license and getting pulled over. Really, that one, that one, you know, law enforcement does not take kindly to that. (laughs) How about scheduled to pick up your children at four and you remember it at five? (laughs) I'm sure nobody's gotten the mommy or daddy of the year award for that one. For the last few weeks, we have made our way through the book of Hebrews. I have enjoyed it very much. I hope you all have too. Hebrews is a great book. And we've learned so much about who Jesus is and what he's accomplished and what we can look forward to. My goodness. This preacher or this author ends his sermon or letter, however you want to look at the book of Hebrews, with a message of... Don't forget. Don't forget. This morning, please take your Bible in whatever format you have, whether you have a a paper Bible or whether you like to use your phone. Go ahead. I'm okay with that. You can use your phone. Uh, This morning, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, if that's helpful for you. Turn to chapter 13 and then just kind of keep it open. I'm going to refer to it all through. As a matter of fact, we're not going to stand this morning because I'm going to take this chapter in little bits and pieces. Hebrews 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. Now we know because we've been in Hebrews for several weeks that this church was a loving, helpful, giving church. And so he tells them, let brotherly love continue. This letter was intended to be read aloud and shared with the community of faith. While it certainly speaks to us as individuals, we want to always read Hebrews especially in the context of how the whole church would have heard it. It's a message not only to me, myself, and I. It's a message to each individual congregation. And in the original people that would have heard it, the original audience, 
This letter would mean a lot because they had been through a lot. They had been ostracized, written off, made fun of. From time to time, they were publicly humiliated and sometimes cruelly persecuted financially, physically, and socially. Through it all, they had taken care of each other. They had helped each other in all kinds of ways and in all kinds of situations. You see, when anyone becomes a Christian, they become a part of the family of God. I hope all of you got in here in time to hear at least a little piece of the disco tune I played this morning. We are family. When you become saved, you are part of a family. The family of God. And families care for each other. Just what you were saying, Randy. Thankful that we're all here. Thankful for everybody in the building. Maybe what had happened in this church is that they had started well. When, when somebody maybe first got sick or, or got thrown out of their house because they had become a Christian, the church ramped it up and took good care of them. But now this church has been around for years and the hard times keep on keeping on. Anybody relate to that? And maybe some in the church had become burned out. Or maybe they had just gotten tired. Or for some other reason, maybe they were not so quick or so ready to help one another. The Holy Spirit, through this letter, reminded them and reminds us, don't forget, love each other. Care for each other. We are family. Verses 2 and 3. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourself are in the body also. This preacher is expressing the concept of hospitality. Before we can talk about hospitality, we've got to get a grip on what hospitality meant in first century. It's really important. People who traveled during the time period of Jesus and during the time period of this church when it was written, they could stay in a place that we call, and we all think of it because of the Bible story of Jesus, an inn. But here's the reality, not Christian history, just history history. Here's the reality about inns in those days. They were not a motel, hotel, or even a hostel. They were nothing like that. Inns during that time period were rough, unsafe, unsanitary, and very expensive. So, what the people did it became the practice in ancient Middle Eastern people in that whole area to open their homes to any relative, no matter how remote or distant that was traveling. Or it would be the practice if you were a baker and you had to travel to a town, you would stay with a baker. Or if you were a tanner and you had to travel somewhere, you would stay with the tanner. Whatever the case may be, if you were a carpenter, you'd stay with a carpenter. And they would take you in for your travel time. That was a part. And today, if you do any study of the Bedouin tribes in the Middle East, they still do that. It was not expected. Now, here's a biggie with hospitality, because here's where we in 2024 get wacko. Yes, we are wacko sometimes. It was not expected to pamper them or to host extravagantly. It was expected to meet their need and share what you had so that the traveler experienced safety and food. That was the purpose of hospitality, and that's how they practiced hospitality. 
even if that meant a blanket on a dirt floor and a piece of bread. You see, sometimes we don't practice, practice hospitality because we're scared to death somebody might see my house. Or we're scared to death uh, I can't have them over because I'd have to go buy a roast and I'd have to fix this and I'd have to do that and I'd have to make a cake. La, 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 la. Man, we need to remember that maybe hospitality is as simple in our day as picking up the phone and saying, hey, I missed you, are you okay? You need anything? I'm going to Walmart, can I pick you up anything? That is not hard. Now in the context of the family of God, for these people, and I think for us, it would mean Christians offer hospitality to other Christians for sure. How this could translate maybe more for us is that we share what we have not only with our family and friends, but with the local faith body that we're part of. And I'm not talking about wants or desires. I'm not talking about people who take advantage of others. If, some, if you feel like somebody's taking advantage of you in this church, and I don't know about it, if you'll come and talk to me about it, I'd be happy to talk, to talk with them about that. Don't ever go there. Don't ever be bullied. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is being in tune with each other. So in tune with each other that I know uh, uh, if you need a ride somewhere because your car's broke. And, and I think that sometimes is where we miss it because we get so involved in our own lives, we don't even know what's going on. Or in our day, I think a little harder one is, I don't want to let anybody know I have a need. That pride thing starts creeping up. And we've, we've already seen in Hebrews where pride stands. And it's not a good place. There are other scriptures that talk about doing or giving our best to help others. But this scripture is speaking to people in a local community of faith to make sure everybody in the congregation's needs are met. And it's a good place to say thank you. Thank you so much. You have met mine and Jay's needs so many times. I've, I, I know I try really hard to get thank you cards out, but you guys are so overwhelming with your goodness to us. Sometimes that doesn't, I can't even make it happen. Thank you so much. And if somebody has helped you along the way somewhere, go to them and thank them. That's what Thanksgiving is about. The Holy Spirit, through this letter, reminded them and reminds us, don't forget, love each other, care for each other. We are family. Now, in this day and in this time, people, I, time people, in this day and in this place and in this time, our scripture today is specific about caring for prisoners that are Christian because they are in jail because they are Christian. Now there's other scriptures in other parts of the Bible that talk to us about caring for prisoners who have committed crimes and who have been incarcerated. But here in Hebrews, that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is the local church taking care of people who have been put in jail, ostracized, kicked off their property, um, indebted, whatever, and it had landed them in jail. And here it is very possible that this was written during the time of Nero where he was burning them alive to light his garden. I mean, and in those days, if somebody didn't bring you food when you were in jail, you didn't eat. And if somebody didn't bring you clean clothes, you didn't change. And if somebody didn't take care of your toiletry stuff, it sat in the cell with you. So what this writer was telling them, now when any of y'all get put in jail for your faith, and they were, and they got, it got worse, as history has shown us, they were to take care of each other when that happened. 
So I had to think, how does that apply to us? And man, it didn't take but two seconds for the Holy Spirit to go, what? Duh! There are still places where Christians must worship in secret. There are places where they have to hide their faith. There are places where they have to leave their family when they become a Christian. There are places where they are still ostracized, humiliated, and even punished because they are a believer in Jesus Christ. I cannot think of a better way that we can provide hospitality for people like that than through missions. Kelly didn't know I was going to talk about missions this morning, but I just want to briefly talk about missions. The Church of the Nazarene, and I can brag on them. I don't, uh, 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 can't always brag on them. It's online, sorry. But I can brag on them for their mission program, the way it is organized and the way they manage it. When you give to missions, it really is going to go to help people somewhere. I cannot say because I have a friend who is in a, a country in North Africa. She is the only Christian in a city of about 100,000. And she has flocks of women in that country who come, who are totally covered with their little thing, and they come to her house for dinner. She has dinners that are open to women because in that country she can only even talk to women. And they come in droves and they ask, will you read the Bible to us? When you give to missions, a little of what you give goes to my friend. I can't think of a better way to help our brethren who really are, don't have the freedoms we have and that we, I think, often take for granted. The Holy Spirit, through this letter, reminded them and reminds us, don't forget, love each other. Care for each other. We are family. Verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. It seems as if this writer totally changes subjects. But he, he really isn't. If we can't show love, care, hospitality, kindness, faithfulness, and honesty to those closest to us, i.e. especially spouses, how can we show it to the family of God? Oh, we might, we might pull it off and fake it for a while, but it will only be for a while before that fades and shows through. The congregation here in Hebrews is called to be faithful in every way, including to their spouse or the people closest to them, knowing that God in all of his goodness will judge those who take advantage of, betray, or deceive, or neglect others. That, that's what this boils down to. The Holy Spirit, through this letter, reminds us, don't forget... Love each other, including your spouses, including those closest to you. Because I'm telling you right now, I love Jay Cantrell more than anything else in this world, but there's days when I'd like to punch him in the head. <laughs> and I'm sure he feels the same way about me. But love rules when Christ rules. Truth truth. Love each other. Care for each other. We are family. Verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me. Jesus left heaven, emptied himself of his godhood, 
became a human with all of our frailty because he loved us unselfishly. He will be with us through thick and thin. He is our helper no matter what. Good times, bad times, and all the times in between. Jesus will give us wisdom, grace, and assurance. Therefore, our attitude and behavior is to be the same. Covetousness is defined in two ways. First, it's an extreme desire to possess something, person, place, or thing, that doesn't belong to us. I think every commercial on TV is trying to get us to be covetous. Because they're trying to convince us, I need that. And they show, here's what kills me, is they always show beautiful people having a beautiful time on TV, on commercials. Think about it. And I think we are, have been so bombarded by that for our whole lifetimes. Everybody in this room, I would guess there's nobody in this room. Is there anybody in here who doesn't remember when you didn't have radio or TV? We've all been bombarded by that our whole lives. So we begin to think covetousness is just part of it. Wanting something that belongs to somebody else or that somebody else has. Boy, I sure would like to have that. The other definition of covetousness is an excessive desire for material wealth and or possessions. Folks, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful with this stuff. Remember, we're talking about care in the body of believers. In that context, what might that mean for us? Maybe it means neglecting someone so that we can get something. Well, I'm not going to give to missions this week because I want to go to Starbucks. Well, I want to go out to eat later, so I just won't give any offering at all. I can't do both. Now, I've, I've fixated on money there, but you know, covetousness often does. Maybe it means we spend all of our time earning money and spending it on really selfish desires when we are well aware that somebody else is struggling just to make ends meet. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pay your bills. Please pay your bills. But I am saying if you know somebody's struggling, how can you buy stuff that, that doesn't really matter? I mean, how, and we do it all the time. Come on, be honest. I'm not the only one. Maybe it means we ignore people who God has placed in our circle because we're so driven to make money for now or to ensure our future. Yeah, there's this thing called workaholism. We have to be real careful with it so that we don't neglect those closest to us, which would be family, and those in our circle, which could be church or our work. Nothing can replace giving yourself to a person, giving your time to a person. Nothing. Anytime we act upon the extreme desire to possess something that isn't ours, it means, it really does mean, somebody else is going to suffer. The Holy Spirit, through this letter, reminded them and reminds us, don't forget, love each other, care for each other, we are family. Verses 7 through 9. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have no profit those who have been occupied with them. 
These folks were to carefully consider what teaching they were listening to. And today, for us, this is probably more of an issue than it was even in the first century. Please, please, be sure that who you are listening to, who you are reading, who you are watching on TV, or all the multiple media sources that are out there, is in line with the Bible. That's all I got to say about that. If they are not in line with the Bible, turn them off. Throw, I threw a book in the trash. Now you all that know me well know I've got lots of books. I've got a library. Jay hates it, but I've got a big library. But I have thrown books in the trash before because I don't want anybody else reading them either because they did not line up with the Bible. Oh, but that means you've got to know what's in the Bible, doesn't it? Hmm. That's not in my sermon. I just thought I'd throw that one in there. How do we guard ourselves? I think there's a safe way we can guard ourselves. When we hear a teaching, ask ourselves, does this line up, number one, with Scripture? Number two, does it line up with over 2,000 years of church doctrine? And, and I'm not talking about... Uh, this church does it this way and they do baptism, whatever the case may be, they do it this way. I'm not talking about practice. I'm talking about what has been the tradition of the church for 2,000 years. The tradition of the church is that Jesus is the only way. The tradition of the church is that God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, we don't understand it, but they are one being. The teaching of the church is that God miraculously came to Mary and she became pregnant the teaching of the church for 2,000 years, I mean, I could go on, is that we are, we get baptized. The teaching of the church is we share communion. I'm not talking about the how, I'm talking about what's 2,000 years of, of teaching that hasn't changed. If you're listening to someone and it's not lining up with that, you better back up and think about what they're saying. Another way to do is... What have Christians experienced from the time Jesus walked the earth to the time that's now? If you have someone out there that's saying, well, if you have enough faith, you just ask God for it and he'll give you that Cadillac. I've heard it. And I'm here to tell you right now, if you look at Jesus' life, he wasn't driving no Cadillac. He wasn't even, he, he got a donkey for one afternoon. Other than that, he had to walk everywhere he went. I mean, come on. It, is what they're teaching the experience of Christians for 2,000 years? Because if it's not, you better question it. I heard one person say, if you put a quarter in your shoe and send me $100, that quarter will multiply. Folks, there's some crazy stuff out there. Quarter in my shoe and give him $100? Hmm. The last one is, God has given you a brain. Please use it. Please be rational. Put a quarter in your shoe and send $100 to somebody is not going to work. I mean, be rational. Use your brain. God doesn't say check your brain when you're listening to religious stuff. The Holy Spirit through this letter reminded them and reminds us, don't forget, love each other, care for each other. We are a family. Verses 10 through 16, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those Animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, 
giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Let me boil all that down. Don't forget to live in humility and praise. I, can I boil it down that hard, Orville? <laughs> can I boil, boil it down that, that hard? Because I think I can. Jesus was so humble. This Jesus commanded angels, but he was so humble that he died as a criminal so that sin and death was not the final outcome. That's humility. Remember from chapter 12 last week, we are to focus and follow Jesus. Never give up, never give out, never quit moving toward the goal. And as we look at the humility of Jesus, we too walk, talk, and behave from a stance of humility. The minute it becomes my way or the highway, you're on thin ice. What is interesting is that the humility before God seems to begin and end with praise. You see, praise is what keeps us from thinking we've done it ourselves. I was real good this week. I called five people and I went and talked to somebody and they got saved and uh, I took care of 14 little kids in my house and I told them the story of Jesus. All I heard was, I, 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 I. We best show humility when we praise God for absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. When you walk through your house this afternoon, praise God for everything you see. When you get out there and see those desserts, praise God for everything you're going to eat. When you go tonight to that big dinner and get that hunk of turkey the size of a turkey leg, praise God. When you look around and see multiple churches worshiping together, praise God. When we're in this place and you look around and say, oh man, that person's been so good to me, praise God. Humility begins and ends with praise. Jesus showed us that time after time after time. Verse 17 through 19. Obey, the, obey those... I'm running out of time. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. We humans, even in the church, tend to think our personal definitions, opinions, and feelings and views are right. I believe, in essence, this passage is attempting to help Christians understand we really are to listen to each other. We really are to open ourselves to the possibility that our opinion might be wrong. This is one of the reasons that we're to submit to the collective leadership in the church. 